Welcome to This Week in Nickelodeon History. I am your captain, Captain Eric. It's a pleasure to welcome you aboard as we celebrate some Nickelodeon anniversaries that have taken place in between the times of September 25th to October 1st. And just so you know, the fourth season of I'm Ready, a SpongePod Squarecast has been dropped, and uh, I am more than excited to plug it here for you guys. So if you're listening to this, definitely go and check out the, uh, the fourth season of I'm Ready, a SpongePod Squarecast. New themes, new new parts of the show. Uh, well, there's so much we go over just in that first episode. It's fear of a Krabby Patty for SpongeBob. And I talk all about fears. We go into the episode, and it's a good conversation. I'm, I'm extremely proud of the fourth season premiere of that. So if you do anything else with your day other than listen to this podcast, it's this podcast, Fancy Dining, breathing, and then listening to the premiere of I'm Ready, a SpongePod Squarecast. That's everything you should keep in your head as of this moment. Uh, just so you know, I am two for two in calling out the uh, surprise racers for Nickelodeon Kart Racers 3. The Twitter account has been having a weekly slow drip of new character announcements by placing these silhouettes of characters on top of one another in a Guess Who style Twitter game in which entries can earn you uh, a possibility of earning a free code, a digital download for Nickelodeon Kart Racers 3. During week one, I correctly guessed Jimmy Neutron and Cindy Vortex, and week two, it was Chucky Finster and Susie Carmichael. And for those who look at that, uh, that second silhouette and go, how did you get Chucky and Susie? It's all in the sleeves. Once I knew that that was Chucky's sleeve, I, I was able to look at that other one and just deduce that out of all of the characters in Rugrats, there's very few that have their sleeves go halfway down their arm. Susie is one of those characters. And and she seems like an obvious choice of a new Nicktoon to join the uh, the kart racing lineup. So I am I'm excited to see what other characters they try to surprise us with. I'm ready to go 3-0 and next week. And you should certainly join in on the fun. They're showing off the game in a, in a big way over there on Twitter. Uh, some very exciting tracks coming down the pipe. Some exciting characters to look forward to, especially the addition of Jimmy and Cindy. That's that's a cool one. I'm hoping that we get Timmy Turner at some point in both Kart Racers 3 and then some sort of announcement between him and Jimmy in All-Star Brawl. Uh, that's something we're really missing is some fairly odd parents representation in these games. They are missing across the board, and, and I have no idea why, but uh, hopefully we get to that. Uh, for this week, we're going to start all the way back with not a TV show, but a longstanding uh, Nickelodeon tradition for the Halloween season. I'm talking about Nick or Treat, which got its start all the way back in 1985. I usually have the years already set for this moment, and I don't, but I can do it right now. And, oh my goodness... It's my favorite number. 37. Shut up. 37 years ago, on October 1st, 1985, we had the very first Nick or Treat celebration on Nickelodeon. Nick or Treat was the overall branding for the October month. Every single year, they would not only celebrate Nick or Treat season, but they would also have certain prizes that they would give out in a variety of different ways. And sometimes these would be uh, possibility of winning a grand prize to sometimes uh, 500 different mini prizes that they would give out. Each and every year was different. I mean, for example, in 1995, you had the possibility of winning Ah Real Monsters VHS tapes, a copy of Knuckles Chaotix, and the Sega 32X add-on for the Sega Genesis. Uh, Ah Real Monsters for the Sega Genesis as well. And also the possibility of one winner receiving a new television, which I got to imagine in 1995 was possibly a massive brick of a TV. I haven't exactly found any of the commercials yet for it, but 
it was really interesting. It was a fun time to to be a kid. What you know, you're watching television, and especially it's starting to get cold around October, and uh, especially the Halloween themed cartoons that they aired at nauseum in October. I didn't have a problem with it because those were my favorite kind of episodes of any show. Uh, my favorite episodes of Doug are always the ones that deal with the the haunted or the supernatural. I love our real monsters. I love the spooky episodes of Hey Arnold and SpongeBob. So. Those were always fun to constantly see, get as much airtime as possible throughout the October month. And the overarching contest and celebration of Nick or Treat was just the nice little bow on top of the entire season itself. And uh, it's sorely missed. They did bring it back for one little stint in 2015, a part of Teen Nick's The Splat. But, I mean, that's all for a whole, like, nostalgia pop type situation. And Nick or Treat has not come back. In, in its proper form since 2002 on, on Nickelodeon. I hope to see it return one day. 32 years ago, on September 29th, 1990, we had the final episode of Skate TV. Created by one of the Z-Boys, Nathan Pratt, the show ran for one season of 13 episodes. This was a variety show all about skateboarding. They would go on location with skateboarders. They would bring skateboarders to the skate TV ramps and pools that they had. It was all about skating. And if you're into skateboarding, even now, I would say it's still worth going out of your way to check out. The show was hosted by Skate Master Tate and Matthew Lynn. Now, that name might not sound familiar, but that's because he was going by Matthew Lynn at the time. I'm talking about Matthew Lillard who is known for his role in the Scream franchise, but also for the Scooby-Doo franchise, playing Shaggy Rogers in the first two live-action movies before being the official voice of Shaggy from 2009 onward in most animated productions. Um, Yeah, Matthew Lillard hosting the skateboarding show on uh, Nickelodeon. A bunch of skateboarding legends have gone through Skate TV. Tony Hawk, Nottis Coptis, Bucky Lassick... And during the captain's top five of the week this week, I thought that I would give you my top five skateboarders of all time. So if you are into skating at all, definitely get ready for that top five. One day later, on September 30th, 1990, 32 years ago, Nickelodeon's variety show Total Panic finished its run on Nickelodeon. Running for one season of an undisclosed amount of episodes, the variety show was created by Jeffrey Darby and Andy Bomberger. 28 years ago, on October 1st, 1994, Clarissa Explains It All finished its run on Nickelodeon. Created by Mitchell Kriegman, the show ran for five seasons of 65 episodes. I have so much love for Melissa Joan Hart. I definitely had a crush on her as a kid, and I enjoyed Clarissa Explains It All even beyond Melissa. I enjoyed the family dynamic. The writing of the the show was always so quippy and enjoyable, and, and it was a different experience than most of the other sitcoms that were available at the time. I I had a fun time watching it, and I would have no problem going back and watching it now. If you have never watched it, I can only recommend it if you enjoy sitcoms. If you enjoy sitcoms in any capacity, the, the multicam ones, the, the usual formula, then I think you'll enjoy yourself. I think you'll have a, a fun time watching this. Fifteen years ago, on September 29th, 2007, we had the final episode of Let's Just Go Play... <laughs> Let's Just Play Go Healthy Challenge. That's a terrible title. I apologize whoever signed off on that, but it's a terrible title. Let's just play Go Healthy Challenge. This is a reality series that ran for two seasons of 13 episodes, with each season following kids over a six-month period looking to make their lives healthier. And this was also in connection with the Worldwide Day of Play, which, for those of you that don't remember, this was an annual day in which Nickelodeon would black out all of their channels for a three-hour period to give children the initiative to go outside and and to, to be healthy and be active and get out there. Don't sit in front of the TV. Yet, I got to imagine so many kids just changed the channel to another network that was playing something. I, I really respect Nickelodeon's gumption on taking away three hours of possible advertisement for uh, for this initiative. 
I stand behind it, but I can't remember any time I actually went out and and contributed to the worldwide day of play. I spent a lot of Saturdays, especially hanging out at my dad's house, exploring the woods out behind the house, playing outdoors, playing in the pool, being active, having a scooter, a bike, a skateboard. I was good. I was an active kid, so it's not like I was just sitting in front of the television all the time, but the television is also not going to force me or tell me when to be active. I'll, I'll tell the television when, when I'm going to be active and it's going to do nothing. It's going to sit there and take it. And if it tries to tell me to do anything, I'll just change it to another channel. That's it. Problem solved. Also 15 years ago, on September 29th, 2007, we had the premiere of Back at the Barnyard. Created by Steve Odenkirk, the show ran for two seasons of 52 episodes. Just like the adventures of Jimmy Neutron Boy Genius, Back at the Barnyard was a spinoff of a Nickelodeon movie. Barnyard premiered on August 4th, 2006, and was made for a budget of $51 million and would go on to make $116 million at the box office. Not as big of a hit as Jimmy Neutron, but still respectable. And Back at the Barnyard showed us that, yet again, you could take a concept from a movie, expand it into a TV show, and and find so many new avenues that you wouldn't have even thought about coming out of that movie. I mean, I can tell you, even coming out of Jimmy Neutron, there's no way I could have called some of the adventures that we would we would go on through the adventures of Jimmy Neutron Boy Genius, including spinning off with the Fairly Odd Parents. But there's no way, coming out of Barnyard, even if you figured... Ah, uh, they're going to make a TV show out of this. That you would have seen any of the the writing or antics that would happen on Back at the Barnyard. And honestly, year after year, I continually hear more favorable things said about Back at the Barnyard than there used to be. So it's on the up and up, and if you haven't watched it, I would say it's worth your time. Ten years ago, on September 29th, 2012, we had the premiere of Nickelodeon's very first Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. The Ninja Turtles were originally created by Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird. The entire brand of Ninja Turtles were acquired by Viacom in 2009, and they immediately were swept into the Nickelodeon family, with this series being the very first one being put in production for Nickelodeon. And out of the gate, let me just say, this one is a slam dunk, a home run, Knock out of the park. I I can't say enough good things about this show. From the animation, to the writing, to the voice acting, which bringing back some of the classic voice actors and giving them new turtles to spin on is just genius. Rob Paulson was brought back, who originally voiced Raphael in the 80s show, was given the task to voice Donatello in this new show. And it is incredible to me that... You could make an iconic voice for one turtle for one generation and then come in and bring an entirely new voice to an entirely new turtle. It's just one of the many reasons why I love Rob Paulson. But the animation is absolutely gorgeous. The writing is is funny. It's quippy. These characters are well written. They're interesting. The the way that they remix what you would expect from characters like April O'Neil and Shredder. There's new villains to enjoy, new threats, and they evolve throughout the series. There's a serialized format in which, you know, actions that happen in one episode could have massive consequences in in later episodes or even in a later season coming back to a thread that you may have forgotten about. I cannot recommend this show enough. I, I think it was the right remix of all of the different iterations of the Turtles up to that point. They even had a crossover episode with the original 80s show, which I know the 2003 Turtles did as well with the Turtles Forever movie, but it was really special for for this iteration to get a crossover as well. I I really enjoyed it. Um, I haven't dived into the rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles show at all, but the movie from the marketing, the trailer, and all of the comments about it have, have said glowing things about not only that movie, but then has gone back onto the show itself with all of this good praise. So I'll have to check that one out as soon as possible. But if you haven't checked out 
this iteration of the Ninja Turtles and you're a fan in any capacity, I can't recommend this version enough. 14 years ago on September 27th, 2008, My Family's Got Guts finished its run on Nickelodeon. Presented by Ben Lyons and Asha Kirtan, the show ran for two seasons of 22 episodes, but technically only one season aired in North America. That September 27th date is just for the finale of the first season. For some reason, the second season only aired outside of the United States. 13 years ago, on September 28th, 2009, we had the premiere of Brain Surge on Nickelodeon. Created by Scott A. Stone and Clay Newbill, the show was hosted by Jeff Supton and ran for three seasons of 120 episodes. Speaking of the worldwide day of play, the final one took place three years ago on September 28th, 2019. And a day later, three years ago, on September 29th, 2019, we had the final episode of Middle School Moguls. Created by Gina and Janae Heitkamp, the show ran for one season of four episodes. As we end every episode for this week in Nickelodeon history, it's time to give you my top five of the week. And this week, since we spoke about skate TV, I thought it would be appropriate to give you my top five skateboarders of all time. And instead of talking your ear off about each and every skateboarder, I'm going to give you a quick synopsis over each and every skateboarder. And if they sound interesting to you, I recommend looking up a compilation. Number five, Mike Vallely. This guy is pure, hard-knocking, hardcore when it comes to skating. A street skater who uses his body and literally anything in front of him to skateboard. I'm not talking about jumping on something random, but if if there's a alleyway in front of you with some trash and a dumpster and you got to get from point A to point B, Mike is going to do it in the most impressive way possible and in ways that you would just not see any other skateboarder handle both a skateboard and the terrain that he is surrounded. Mike is through and through one of my favorite skateboarders to watch because I'm constantly impressed over the ways he comes up with moves to use his body, the board, and especially the world around him. For number four, we're going from street skating to vert skating because we're taking it to the air with Bob Bernquist, one of the most exciting skaters you will ever see with a skateboard in a ramp of any size. Tony Hawk was my entry into vert skating, but Bob was the reason I stayed watching vert skateboarding. I, I enjoyed a lot of the street skating more, but there was no denying what Bob was able to do uh, from ramp to ramp. Number three, going from the streets to the air, back to the streets, Rodney Mullen. Now, for everything that I told you about Mike and using the terrain around him, Rodney is just the Albert Einstein of street skating. And I'm talking about the flatland maneuvers that were introduced later in the Tony Hawk series, but became some of my favorite maneuvers to use. When you were in the middle of a manual, you were able to pull out a whole multitude of tricks, all of which, or at least most of which, were originated by skaters such as Rodney Mullen, who were able to just do things with the skateboard, their body, and wherever they happened to be in ways that no one had thought about doing. And even when it became a popular way to maneuver the skateboard, Rodney would still show up and, and still be number one above all anyone else. I can't recommend looking up a Rodney Mullen compilation more. Uh, I Just do it. Just spend your time and look up a Rodney Mullen compilation. Number two may be surprising because most of you would probably expect this person to be number one, but number two is Tony Hawk. Although I will say right now he is my number one most nostalgic skateboarder. He's the one that I think about the most when I think about skateboarding, he is the one who brought skateboarding into more homes than any other skater in the history of the world and is, on top of that, an upstanding guy. But my number one favorite skater of all time is Bam Margera. And although he has had rough times over the last decade or so, I can't deny the effect that Bam had on my life during this time that I was skateboarding the most. I bought the most Bam boards. Than any other skater, I had the most BAM t-shirts, I had BAM 
shoes, all of my skate shoes were were audio shoes, black, purple with the heartogram, Bam Margera, everything. And for almost my entire skateboarding existence, I had something either on me or on my board that was associated with Bam Margera, an element board, thunder trucks. I, I forgot exactly the kind of wheels and bearings at this moment. Usually lucky bearings were what I would go with anyway. Uh, but I was I was a BAM fan. And for some, he may not have been the most exciting skater to watch, but he was a skater that got me to want to get up off the couch and to get out and skate. Tony, to some extent, had that effect, but BAM was the one that I watched the most of and that I would I would want to emulate in some regard. Maybe not beating up my father, but... I wanted to skate like him. I wanted to be like him, and it, it's what got me onto a skateboard. He's the skater that got me to want to skate. So I I love Tony Hawk, and I have so much love for him. But when I think back, what was I spending all of my money on? Who had my attention as a skateboarding fan? And it was Bam. It was Bam Margera. So I hope wherever Bam is, I hope he finds some peace and happiness wherever he happens to be. I have so much love and respect for the guy, for what he brought to my life during rough periods. So that's that's all I'll ever hope for any of those that I have looked up to in the world of entertainment. And I cannot appreciate all of you out there enough for listening to this show. Thank you for joining me this week. It's been a pleasure to welcome you aboard the ship. You can reach Captain Eric at Nickelodeon History at gmail.com if you have any questions or comments that you want read out in the show if you have anything Nickelodeon or 90s nostalgic related that you want promoted art Instagram a YouTube channel otherwise you can reach me at Nickelodeon history at gmail.com you can also follow me on Twitter at I'm ready podcast and on Instagram at SpongeBob podcast please check out my other podcast I'm ready a sponge pod squarecast dropping every Thursday on most conceivable podcasting platforms. And don't forget to subscribe to the Captain Eric YouTube channel, where you can also hit that bell to sign up for notifications so you can know anytime the captain puts something out. You can also purchase new and updated merch at the Redbubble link, either in the podcast description or in the link from any of my socials. Anything that comes in through my projects go directly back into my projects, and it is always appreciated. As always, mateys, please stay safe, be kind to one another, and come aboard again next week to This Week in Nickelodeon History. On the Lord of Hibbert, Nick. On the Lord of Hibbert, Nick, Nick. On the Ricky Tiggy Low, while living number one, Nickelodeon.